all sense of conflict between reason and faith in the Guru will vanish as we proceed in the study of the teaching. The sages, as a rule, appeal to our own experience as worldly men. And the sage of Arunachala is no exception. It is true, as we already saw, that our experience is discredited as the offspring of the primary ignorance. But even out of it, the sages are able to pick out facts that make it easier for us to accept their teaching, revolutionary as it seems to be at almost every step. The light that they shed on our own past experience enables us to see that, in truth, there is no real conflict between faith and reason. This being the true nature of what has been called authority, it follows that in the last resort, everyone is his own authority. Before accepting the teaching of a sage as authoritative, he must decide for himself whether or not he is a sage, a being having intimate experience of the real self and established by virtue of that experience in the state of deliverance or self-realization, which he himself wants to attain. He must come to the conclusion that the one in question is in the enjoyment of unalloyed and uninterrupted happiness due to his freedom from desire and fear, the two enemies of happiness. The disciple is not asked to surrender his reason until he finds one to whom he can surrender it with the prospect of incalculable gain. The sage to whom he makes this surrender becomes his guru or master. It is not possible to lay down clear rules to guide the novice in the delicate business of recognizing a sage. And it may be said that no rules are really necessary. He that is destined to find a sage and to become his disciple will find no practical difficulty in recognizing him when he finds him. For those that are not so destined, rules will be of little use. Divine grace plays a decisive part in the process by which the sage is recognized as such and accepted as one's own guru. But when once the choice is made, the disciple can use the available tests of sagehood in order to confirm his choice. The chief test is serenity and unruffled happiness, which is the same as perfect peace. Another test is egolessness. And this is proved chiefly by indifference to praise and censure. Other tests will appear in the course of this exposition. We shall now discuss the notion of authority, which is upheld by the orthodox pendant, the scholar who has not sat at the feet of a sage. This notion is as follows. There are certain books which are unquestionably authoritative in their entirety because they are of divine origin. Every sentence or clause of a sentence in them is divine, and it is not permissible to us to doubt their authenticity and authority. It is said that the books prove themselves. In this sense, authority is a kind of spiritual dictatorship imposed from without. The subservience of the seeker of the truth goes further still. Not only must he accept the sacred lore, such as the Bible, as authoritative, but he must also bind himself in advance to accept the interpretations of disputed passages which these scholars offer. This notion is one of the many untoward effects of the organization of religions into churches or hierarchies. It must be said that this notion is good enough for the man who is content to live and die in ignorance. He that wills to rise above it needs authority of a different kind. Even the sacred lore is of relative value and needs evidence of some kind to prove its worth. 
there is only one thing that proves itself, namely the self, Atman. The upholders of the orthodox view do not recognize the testimony of a living sage as having any authority of its own. They believe that a special sacredness attaches to the ancient lore and that no additions can be made to it. But the truth is the other way around. The reason for the authoritative nature of the ancient lore is the fact that it contains passages which are more or less faithful records of the testimony of sages that lived in the past. And sages are the same at all times. As the ancient lore itself tells us, they are not in time, but transcend it. Further in the sacred lore, we have the injunction that we should receive instruction from a living sage. The truth is that the sage is not a person, but an embodiment of divinity. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, the sage is myself. And this, which is one of the fundamental teachings of the ancient lore, seems to be insufficiently understood by the scholars. Besides, the most natural way for us to start with the teaching of a living sage, for we are able to determine by our intuitive perception whether the teacher is a sage or not. We cannot thus judge any sage of the past. Besides, we can never be quite sure that the books as we now find them are a faithful record of what the sages had said. It seems probable that these books are made up of the actual utterances of sages, along with other passages composed by philosophers who were not sages. It would seem that the evidentiary text remained unrecorded for a long time before they were incorporated into the books. During the interval, the text must have been preserved by oral tradition, which may account for the fact that the same passages occur in different books, but with variations. The claim that is made for the ancient lore is based on its being prior in time. But priority in time is no consideration at all in any inquiry in which the validity of time itself as an objective reality is in question, as we shall see in due course. Our first reliance, therefore, shall be on the testimony of the sage of Aranachala. We shall make use of the ancient lore by way of amplification or commentary. <laughs>